So um, let's continue what we're talking about today. I just want to highlight, you know, there's not a lot of regions in this class, so there are some that you should be aware of what's important um, in each one. So um, I just want to um, pull out a few key points. And uh, any questions in regards to our last meeting? In any case, let's take a look at the, one of your other readings that you're going to have to do, or should have already done, actually. And um, this is in Robertson by Walter Hedwig. It's called Japanese Archaeology and Cultural Properties Management. Pre-war ideology and post-war legacies. So in other words, what are the continuities between the pre-war period and the post-war period? Sometimes people say imperial Japan and post-imperial Japan. And then it says cultural properties management. Japanese argument. What's cultural? What, what, what is this about? What, what does that mean, cultural properties? You don't usually think of, when you hear the word culture as something being, something concerning property. What does that mean, cultural properties? Fancy way of saying culture. Uh, well, just more than aspects that. of culture. Cultural identity. Cultural identity. Well, what is this about? Uh, academic archaeology and cultural pro cultural properties policy. <coughs> it's about the state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it not? Um, yeah, I'd say cultural properties kind of deals with um, either you know sites or buildings or tangible objects that we see as symbols of culture. Okay. Right. All right. Um, but the important point here is um, it has to do with government agencies yeah. deciding what is Japanese culture, what is not Japanese culture. Right. And right now in Japan, of course, they have a whole government agency that is involved that very question. This is a good example of macro micro, actually, right? The, cult, the Agency for Cultural Affairs, that's at the central level, Tokyo. The Agency for Cultural Affairs is actually a part of a bigger organization, the Ministry of Education, right? And actually, local governments in Japan, uh, prefectural, municipal, okay, are also concerned in determining this question and monitoring guarding cultural properties. This is a big deal. I mean, all there's nothing Japanese about this. All national states do it to varying degrees. We have some similar institutions and government agencies in the United States, for example. But I think you could make the argument that some places are a little more uptight about it than others. And Japan is a place that's very uptight about what's Japanese and what is not Japanese. Okay. So that's what this is about. Okay. And, um, Edwards, well, he gives a little bit of uh, he gives some historical background, um, and particularly archaeological, archaeological sort of say, um, sites in Japan. Why might archaeology be a sensitive issue in Japan? Yes, what, what's your fear? I know who you are. Yes. Origins and authenticity. Is this, you know, how far back can we trace Japan? You can sort of find out archaeological investigations, and it might upset sort of official narrative. Uh, archaeology is a huge deal, it always has been. I mean, from the Jomon to the Yayoi to the, it's it's defining who they are as an identity. They're, they're, they're a country that's very involved mm -hmm. with, with tracing their. But what changed in the 19th century, in the late 19th century? How, what changed when it came to how Japanese viewed these old tombs and these old archaeological sites? Right? I mean, they've been around for a long time, right, as you said, but what was different now? Right? Well, 
as I just said, the you know, there was no national state right for the 19th century in Japan. Now that they have a national state, that state decides: is this tomb worth investigating? Maybe we should. And this is an important issue. Maybe we don't want to dig up that tomb if it's an imperial site because it might jeopardize again the official narrative of the imperial family. So, th so this is a very uh, this has a lot of political, different political angles to it. Okay. What constitutes Japanese-ness? And also, uh, does it fit into the official view of, well, as it was discussed, the, uh, the role of the imperial family in Japanese history? Okay. And so there's nothing very Japanese about this. All national states in very you know, di different ways. But especially national states that are very much concerned about ethno-cultural, you might say ethno-national identity, when there's sort of a single overriding ethno-national identity in places like Korea, for example. Yeah, maybe in China. China's a little complicated, but yeah, there's, certainly in China, this is a big issue, right? Um, how far back does Chinese history go? Have Chinese, have the Han people always lived there, right? These are also political. Have they always been communists? Okay, well, yeah, actually, that's true. Actually, does it fit into the official Marxist explanation of history? What type of, what type of economy do they have? Um, so in any case, uh, Edwards does a pretty good job in this chapter. In uh, page 40, he talks about the effects of imperial ideology on pre-war archaeology. So you can see how this sort of um, social science that is supposed to be objective um, really isn't a, that objective once you inject politics into it. Right? Uh, so yeah, he gives good history here. And then on page 45, he talks about post-war cultural properties policy. Um, and just one example, of, just one example of the different political angles you can use to, to analyze this. He talks about, um, in keeping with the democratic ideals, this is on page 45, in keeping with the democratic ideals brought by the Allied occupation after 1945, and quickly embraced by the defeated nation. A magazine column shortly after the war's end called for a history focused not on elite institutions, but on the common people. A history of the nameless masses born and working in society, of what kind of lively, lively would they practice. So that, that fits in, that sort of resonates with what was going on in Japan after 1945. They're supposed to be more democratic. That you know, many ramifications of that, but he was just pointing out um, one aspect in particular, where instead of focusing on elites, now let's talk about the working people, okay, the, the common folk. Um, let's see, what else is he saying here? Page forty, top page forty-seven. He talks about how some, not all, some Japanese archaeologists um, have been influenced by certain assumptions of the uniqueness and homogeneity of Japanese culture. We talked about that before, right? One of the myths of Japan. Cultural differences among past populations does tend to be downplayed. So, in other words, if you look at Japan going back seven, ten, twelve thousand years, of course, you have different populations living in different parts of Japan. And some Japanese, I, I don't know how widespread this is, but some Japanese anthropologists will, might downplay the differences. While links between contemporary Japanese and the prehistoric inhabitants of the archipelago are overemphasized. So the idea here is they're trying to make an argument. And I don't think all, not all Japanese, some Japanese archaeologists are very serious, but not all, but some might fall into this trap of trying to explain present day Japan by looking at society, at prehistoric Japanese societies dating back thousands of years. That's a big mistake. You shouldn't do that. 
that, that's a type of culturalism, or more specifically, is what I mentioned this word, uh, historicism. Historicism, assuming that things don't change the history, that a people's identity is always the same. So in any case, you can see how some of what Edwards talks about links up with many things, many of the uh, themes that we introduced at the beginning of the semester. So we're actually, you know, you should be always thinking about that, right? Things that I mentioned in class, how how do those ideas or concepts illuminate and illustrate um, certain aspects of the readings. <clears throat>